Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Today, we have the brand new for 2019 Slash Signature EDS-1275 Double Neck. This is the most expensive Slash Signature guitar to date. They come at a whopping $13,299, and they only made 125 of these. Each one of them are hand-signed by Slash and numbered 1 through 125. What we're going to discover today, is this guitar worth $13,000? I had to pay the money so you didn't have to. Let's dig in. So first off, let's talk about Slash's history with the double neck. He was familiar with people like Jimmy Page and John McLaughlin using a double-necked guitar in their performances. He always thought they were a bit overwhelming, and he never dreamed of actually owning one himself. However, it wasn't until the 90s during the Use Your Illusion tour that he finally found himself needing one out of necessity. So he had his tech go and find him one for the song Knocking on Heaven's Door because he had some rhythm stuff that he needed a 12-string to play on, but he also had leads that he needed the 6-string for. But he purposefully sought out this black one because he didn't want to copy Jimmy Page's thing. He's known for kind of that reddish walnut colored looking one. And black is a more rare finish than that, so that kind of gave him his own identity with a black EDS-1275. Now, there's a bunch of other people who have also used these throughout the years. Some of the more notable ones are Steve Clark and Alex Lifeson. They're known for like a white one, but Steve's has a Kaler on it. How crazy is that? We also have Don Felder from the Eagles, as well as Steve Miller from, well, the Steve Miller Band. But that brings us to our next topic. What is a double neck? I'm sure you've heard the term double neck a bunch of times, and this is what most people think of. The EDS-1275, the electric double neck solid body. What this is, is a 12 string guitar on top. You can see 12 tuners, 12 strings. If you've never played a 12 string before, basically it's just like playing a six string, but every single string has been doubled. So you're playing octaves. Then moving on to the bottom, you just have a regular six string guitar. However, these things don't sound regular because they have this massive body. I think these are very ballsy sounding instruments. This is actually the first one I've ever touched and held. So some of my excitement just comes from, you know, actually being able to have one of these. Cause I always had a mentality similar to Slash. I never saw the purpose of these things, but now I get them. But what a lot of people don't realize is the 12 string, six string, while it is the most popular one today, that's not how they started off. There's actually different ones that fuse other instruments together. Things like the EMS 1235, it's an electric mandolin with a guitar. Now you can find an eight string mandolin, you could find like a, a tenor one with a banjo neck. There's a bunch of different iterations out there. There's also the EBS 1250. That's a four string bass with a six string guitar. Elvis was famous for using a six string bass with a six string guitar version. And through custom order, you could do whatever you want really. Like you could even have a six string and a six string. Why would you want that? Alternate tunings, just, you know, by the switch of the neck like this. But essentially the history of the double necks is there were a few in the 1930s. They were kind of lap steel in style. But the first birthing run of these started around 1957 through 1963, and they were spruce tops. They were hollow bodies, so not quite like this one yet. These didn't come out until about 1962 through 1971, and these are the SG solid body style. So you no longer have this giant body on them. It's thin like an SG. It almost feels like it might be a little bit thicker than that. But this is the one that kind of got really popular and used by quite a few rock stars over the years. But after 71, these just kind of disappeared, custom ordered only, and then they kind of brought them back to the catalog around 1974. 
and they've just kind of been on and off in production here and there, but mainly custom orders. I'm not an expert when it comes to the double necks, but, but if you want to see some really cool photos of these things, head on over to Eric Ernest's website. I'll leave a link in the description. It's really fun to look at all the different iterations that have ever been made, especially the vintage ones. And since these were never sold in massive quantities, it makes each and every one collectible in a different way. But now, what is it like to play one of these things? These are my first impressions of ever holding and playing a double neck. Just in general, you feel like a rock star holding one of these things because you've never seen anybody else actually use one. But they feel so powerful to wield because of that. It gives you like this inspiration to play differently than you've ever done. The best way to describe this once you put it on a strap as the name Double Neck implies, it's like you have two guitars on you, but one is strung up about where I would normally have it, and then the other one is like on the strap way down low. You know how Slash is famous for playing it. But, you know, they move at the same time, so that takes a little bit to get used to. It's weird, but, but it's not as crazy to play as I thought it would be. I almost thought this neck would just be in the way. For me personally, it's not. These are quite large, so they fill up your entire body, but you can feel the vibrations everywhere. It's a super resonant guitar. And do you think these things are ridiculously heavy? For this particular run of Slash models, no, they're honestly not, especially when you use this nice thick padded strap that they include with it. This one's around 11 and a half pounds. I've had less paws from the Norlin era that weigh more than that, so it's not as heavy as you might think. But the thing that surprised me the most, picking these things up, I was expecting slim 60s neck profiles, but these are like R7 baseball bat necks. They are huge. It feels powerful. I'll, I'll keep saying that. So that was definitely a surprise to me. Now the big question, is it neck heavy? You can bet your butt it is, but I mean, if you're trying to hold it like this, yeah, you're gonna have problems unless you have this hand resting on it. But I find, you know, whenever you see Slash posing like this, there's a darn good reason. That's how you have to play these things. But you're in that power rock stance. It just adds to the whole vibe of these double necks. It's a lot of fun. But I find you can have a lot of fun with these sitting down as well if you want to actually use both necks at the same time, do some harmonics and whatever. If you're a more skilled player than I am, you could do stuff like that. But now let's go ahead, sit down, and talk about the control layout of this Slash EDS-1275. It's pretty much just like a Les Paul. You have two volumes at the front and two tones. But don't make the same mistake I did. That's not like one volume and tone for each neck. That's actually just for the neck pickup here, and then the bridge pickup down here for both necks. You select what neck you want with this switch. You're gonna notice it's a lot taller than a regular toggle switch. I mean, you can see the difference here. Tiny guy, big guy. So when you have this in the neck position, that's just your 12 string. So six string no longer works. But you still get some of the resonant frequencies because the sympathetic vibrations and things like that. Then bridge position is just your six string. But again, you can still get those sympathetic vibrations which could definitely be used for some cool songwriting ideas. Then the middle position, as you guessed it, you have both necks on. So you could do some interesting things with like harmonics. If you wanted to have two guitar players at the same time, one guy could be doing the lead stuff, one guy could be doing the rhythm. But something that you might not know is the signal is slightly quieter in the middle. Same thing's true on the six string side. But now that we understand this one, let's talk about this one. It's pretty simple. It's just like a regular toggle switch. That selects the bridge pickup of whatever necks you're on. That's the middle position, so both of them, and then just the neck pickups. So it's pretty simple to control the guitar once you just take a second to get used to what these things are doing. But the sympathetic vibration things is kind of fun. Not 
that we understand this guitar, let's go ahead, throw it on the workbench, and yeah, I have to take 18 strings off this thing just to show you how this thing was built. Well, that took forever to do. And unfortunately, my new guitar day was ruined by two undisclosed things that came from a brand new custom shop guitar. I hate it that I always have to talk about things like this, but I, I feel you guys need to know. So the first thing is the wood is literally cracked right here. And you can tell somebody knew that it was cracked because you can see it was like filled in with like some sort of wood filler. You can see evidence of that because it's still stuck to the pick guard. They probably figured uh, nobody's going to ever open this up, so we'll be able to get away with that. that. That's a little bit shoddy, Gibson. I'm sorry. The next thing is the 12 strings neck has been adjusted so much already that your rod really does not have that much life left. You can see those threads sticking out. It can go till about right here until it needs reset, but that's unacceptable to me, and that's the second time I found that on a custom shop guitar. The first time I let it slide and just made an excuse for them, but I'm, I'm sorry. $13,000, I'm a little bit upset right now. Man, this thing is just full of dismay. During my playing demo of this, I recorded an hour and a half. Once I was done, I only had one mic on. So that's why my playing demo sounds really boomy or roomy, because only the room mic was on, not the close mic. But while we've got it taken apart, let's go ahead and look at these things. So neck pickup and bridge pickup for both necks are the Custom Bucker Alnico 3. They just say patent applied for on them. You can see that's true for these as well. Now these necks are pretty far set into the body so you don't actually see any sort of tenon in here. But what you can see is a bunch of the polishing compounds still left over in there. That's not a huge deal since, you know, it's just the pickup cavities. But you can see they age the screws with the same type of stuff to make them look old and rusted. It's kind of a nice touch that they even aged the pickups and the hardware to kind of match the aged finish of the guitar. And it's just pretty much the same stuff going over on the six string side here. But you'll notice what's different, like on a regular Gibson guitar, the leads go that way. But the ones for the six strings, they actually go the opposite way of normal because they're going to that toggle switch. So you can see some cavity openings there and over here. That's kind of cool. Then this one's exiting this way into this chamber. Then so underneath this separate pick guard, so there's actually two pick guards here. I always thought they were just one big connected thing. They're not. This one's a little bit tight, so I don't want to, you know, yank on it and pull something loose. But you got all those wires in there, and then they're all just kind of connected into there. Then you've got some grounding wires going through here. Now those little yellow grounding wires end up here, underneath the bridge, which I'll show you what the back of one of those looks like. They're just bolted onto the body. I figured that was the easiest way, other than taking all the strings off, is just to take those off. But then you can see these touch the end of those ground wires, grounding everything off and the six string side comes out here. And they even tried to age the pick guard a little bit. They also did it slightly uneven to get that kind of authentic look to it. So some nice attention to detail there. But the bridge on these, they have nylon saddles, which captures that whole 60s thing. They briefly use these, but be careful. This is a non-wire ABR1 bridge, meaning these saddles will just fall out. Trust me, I learned that the hard way, but the bottom side of them just read Gibson ABR1. And the same thing's true on the six string side too. But we'll just take a second to appreciate the aging job now that we're directly under the light. You can see all that up and down vertical finish checking. You can't always see it in regular lighting situations, but I think right here on the bench, we're right under that ceiling light so you can see all of these individual scratches that they had to do with the razor blade. That must have took forever. And they also got a bunch of nicks and dings straight through the finish. It's kind of funny that they uh, aged it underneath the pick guard too. But it's probably just easier for them to age the whole thing since the hardware is not on it when they do that. But moving on to the final cavity here, you just kind of got this big switch area right here. But even on a $13,000 Gibson Custom Shop, they still have that dull router bit evidence. That's a little bit upsetting and this, it's unacceptable in my book. I understand why they wanted to fix it, because who wants to throw away this one-piece mahogany body because they messed up right at the end? I think they just should have repaired it much better than they did. Well, there's the back side of that. It's just got that toggle switch. I'm a little bit sad to see that they didn't even try to age the knobs, though. I feel like they could have painted over them a little bit gold or something, or at least tinted the tops of these a bit, because I'm sure slashes, unless they've been changed, had the same aging to them. 
So once again, it is a one piece mahogany body. That is a huge slab of mahogany. A lot of people are worried about these warping over the years because of that. And these also have mahogany necks. Now in the 70s, they switched them to maple necks because they were supposed to be stronger and less prone to warping. So that's probably another reason why these things are so big. But you can see they did try to age the inlays just a little bit. Looks like a little bit of a, a yellow stain just towards the centers of them. I think it looks a little bit cheesy, but you know, they were trying. They were trying. I just love the split parallelogram inlays though. But I always associate these inlays with like the dove. But it's an Indian rosewood fretboard, so no Brazilian or anything. And you've got a Corian nut. And here you can see once again that truss rod and all the finish checking on the face of the headstock. Now, one small thing that I do want to note on these ones, you can see their aging or buffing compound, whatever it is, kind of got bunched up along the nut. You can see that's true on both necks, so they probably should have cleaned that off a little bit. But they also aged the tuners here and got lots of nicks and dings on the headstock. I actually didn't even notice this until I was taking photos of this guitar that they actually dinged up the top of the headstock too. I think that's a really nice touch. A six string neck, you know, pretty much the same stuff. It doesn't look like they did quite as much aging to these inlays though. I almost don't even see any of that yellow stuff until you get to like the third and first inlays right here. But it looks like the custom shop guys get more time to do the binding scraping and stuff like that correctly because I don't see any of those tooling marks along the edges of the fretboard. So those are good. And you've got the tiny fret nibs. Face of the headstock on the six string side, it looks like the truss rod's in a little bit better of shape, but I noticed this one actually does need a slight neck adjustment. It's bowing a little bit, but they also did aging to these tuners. And the six strings bridge actually got aged. Maybe that's just how Slash plays it. His turn kind of more of a color. And you can see they also aged the back side of it too. Cool. Moving on to the back side. Inside here, it's just kind of a standard SG layout. Got four pots and one output jack. And a traditional back plate cover here. But we'll take a minute to appreciate the aging job on the back here. The only thing I wish they would have done differently about this mahogany body is maybe they could have aged this a little bit. It just looks like brand new mahogany right under all this aged paint. I think a darker color would have looked better. But Nyx dings fake finish checking, all that good stuff back here. But what I did like is that they only have the finish checking at the neck heel, and then where you're actually playing, they just have a few light nicks and dings because this finish checking, unlike real finish checking, you can actually, you know, feel it if you put your nail over it. So that's nice that you don't feel that while playing it, but the six string headstock does not have any serial number or anything on it. It's just all on the slash one right here and he numbers all of them right here, one through 125. And the headstock repair. I think there are actually a couple of guys doing these because I see two different versions. One looks like this, which is correct. A headstock would snap like that and have a crack. But then there's another guy that aged them by just going like a zoop right here. Because this one at least looks correct, but it's not actually a break in the wood. It's just the finish that's been removed. But we'll go up the back of the 12 string neck here real quick. But while we're at it, let's go ahead and get some pickup measurements. So six string side bridge pickup reads about 7.46. The neck position is reading hotter than that at 8.02-ish. And in the middle, you get 3.87. Now switching over to the 12 string side, let's see if that's true for the neck pickup here too. Yep, it's about eight. Bridge position, eight. So this one must just be slightly underwound compared to everything else. Interesting. But then the middle position of the 12 string neck, you get about four. Now what I'm really curious is if we'll actually see a drop in reading since it's actually quieter in the middle position since both of them are going. And bam, you can see it in the resistance readings. It goes to half. That's interesting. It must have something to do with how it's wired up. That's all I can say. Nut width on the 12 string, 1.71. That increases to 2.07 at the 12th. The six strings a little skinnier at 1.68 inches. And then move into the 12th, 2.06. First fret neck depth at the 12 string, 0.97. Jeez, that's big. And right after the 11th before the heel starts, 1.02. If you thought I was kidding that it's a big, chunky, rounded neck, I wasn't. The measurements don't lie. The sixth string is 0.93 at the first. 
and just a little more than one inch after the 11th. The scale length is the traditional 24 and 3 quarters inches on the 12 string, and same thing is true on the 6 string side. I think what makes these sound different is just the huge body mass. Now this is by no means the most accurate way to measure it. I'm just kind of holding it on my scale here. So it's a little over 11 pounds. Let's go ahead and hear how it sounds. Question, is this guitar worth $13,299?
No, <laughs> it's not, not for your average guy. These are for collectors. But I think the asking price does make sense if you take everything into account. This is the 27th signature Gibson guitar for Slash, if you count all the different variations, including like age, non-age, age, and signed. And the age signed versions of these things have a history of holding and increasing in value. So a regular EDS 1275 like this, you can custom order one for about $6,000. So that's half the price of this. Whenever the custom shop ages something, they usually tack on a few thousand dollars. And whenever they have the artist sign something, they gotta put his cut in the deal, right? That usually almost doubles the price too. So sticker price wise, it makes sense. If you want one of these, you're gonna find most dealers are not willing to budge at all. Usually you can at least get, you know, five, 10% off of a new guitar, but these guys, they're not budging and they are selling, believe it or not. So I think to the average musician, definitely try out an EDS 1275, even if you've never even thought about it before, because I had a great time with these. I now have a new instrument to obsess over. So yeah, that definitely means I'll try to find that Alex Lifeson version. His has like a coil split switch on the 12 string neck pickup because I had a great time with this guitar. I will no longer look at the EDS 1275 the same way. I understand why people use these things. I also kind of understand the appeal to an electric 12 string now too. So this guitar, while it might not be for everyone, it was certainly eye-opening for me. So let's go ahead and take a look at the condition of this aged relic guitar. As far as aging jobs go, I think this one looks pretty authentic. I mean, there's a few things that I don't quite agree with that they did, but they were trying to make this look like Slash's original. So you can see they did the up and down finish checking on this. That usually means the guitar was in like areas of high humidity and moisture, which would make sense for his, but they've tinted that logo. They aged all the tuners individually and you've got custom on the truss rod cover. You have a rosewood fretboard on this one with the parallelogram inlays, but you've got all these nicks and dings and each of these 125 will be slightly different. I particularly chose this one because I thought the aging job looked the most realistic. And you know, I kind of like the nicks and dings on it, but another thing about this one is the fretboards matched and they were nice and dark. And the headstock repair on the 12 string looked particularly good to me. Now, as far as the neck goes, they definitely did a few dings here, but nothing that you really feel while you're playing. But the only thing I don't like, they did the finish checking a little bit too deep right here. You see how you can see through to the mahogany wood grain? That would never, ever happen on original finish checking. They do all this finish checking with a razor blade, so I almost think they need to not quite go as deep. Because on real finish checking, you really don't feel it. This stuff you can definitely feel. I mean, you can hear me doing it, but it is what it is. You don't have a choice on this one. You have to get them aged. Oh, we'll take a quick look around the edges here. SG body shape style. I almost think they could have uh, done the strap buttons in different locations, but he was just trying to mimic the original 66 that he has. Now we'll take a look at the six string. <laughs> I've never had to do two necks on one guitar before. Same thing on this one. If you look closely, you can see some aging to the inlays as well. That's kind of interesting. I think what would have been a nice touch, but more work for Slash, is if he would have signed one and then numbered the other headstock. I think that would be fun. But I hope you guys enjoyed getting to look at this thing because I figured if I didn't buy it and do an in-depth documentation like this, most people in the world would never have got to see or hear one up close like this. Eh, let's do a blacklight test too. Sadly, nothing too fun to go over here. I mean, the nylon saddles glow a little bit, but the guitar itself, I guess you can kind of see a few of those little dings because they don't have lacquer over them. But just think, for this relic job, somebody had to sit there and do this for 125 guitars. That had to be kind of monotonous, I think. Every nick and ding you see on this thing, they had to do that by hand. So I can appreciate it from that aspect, but hopefully one day we'll figure out how to do uh, finish checking in a slightly more realistic way. I know there's a bunch of different methods, like you can induce it in a natural way, but then you can't actually control the way it looks. So who knows the future of relicking guitars? We'll have to see. 
And now the behemoth case this thing comes with. It's not actually as big as you would think it would be. I could see a Firebird coming in a similar style case. Just the case itself weighs 22 pounds, 13 ounces. So. But it's just kind of got this black leather-like feeling exterior. I don't know, maybe it really is this time, <laughs> who knows? But you've got two locking latches on either side of the case, and then you have just a regular latch here with the Gibson logo on it, kind of like a Lipton style case, and just your traditional handle. Something I wish they would have done to this case to make it a little bit more slash-like was to line it with these belt buckle things like he has on his hat and the strap that comes with this thing. We'll take a closer look at that in a minute. But on the inside here, it's this golden interior. Now, when I was looking at this on Gibson's website, I almost thought, huh, that case doesn't seem very protective. It almost looked like the headstock touched down, things like that. They even have the headstock wedge up there. But in person, this thing is really plush. So you have one layer right here, and then they have additional padding layer here to protect the necks. And then you've got this whole thing acting as a neck support, so that's good. And then this protects from too much empty space right here for the headstocks. I don't really like the headstock wedge. I thought they stopped doing that for a reason. I think these contribute to more headstock breaks when something falls in a case. But I think the idea for Gibson was just to prevent them from moving right here. But inside the pull tab here, you get a little bit of case candy with this thing. The most important piece of case candy, obviously, is the slash strap. These little add-ons will sometimes get sold off separately for crazy money. Like, I bet somebody would pay $1,000 for one of these. But it just has Slash's little logo on it, and it's got the same thing that he has on his hat. I'm not quite sure what these things are called, but they're just, you know, Slash's signature style. But by the smell of it, it's definitely genuine leather, so I'm sure it wasn't even cheap to produce. But then you get the pre-pack checklist. It's the same as anything else. Looks like this was made about two months ago. But that's not your COA. Your COA is right here. And let me tell you, this is a beefed up COA, even for a Gibson. They now have these like laminated clear coats over top of them. Usually you don't get that. And it is individually numbered to this particular guitar, 105. Because since I have 105, I could technically just erase the 05 and claim it's number one, but then you don't have the correct COA, so that's why they do stuff like that. So what is the fate of this ES-1275? Well, I reached out to the store I got it to. They were apologetic, they're taking it back, and I'm looking at a different one that has a very significant serial number. Maybe we'll see another one of these in an unboxing video soon to come. All right, thank you Troglodytes for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.